thank you very much and good afternoon everyone and welcome to this closing event of the first West Yorkshire Innovation Festival. Although mm -hmm. I'm going to let you all into a little secret. There is one more event taking place after this hosted by Nexus, but shh, no one needs to know that. But you should attend it equally. Um, it's clear this week has highlighted the importance of innovation for West Yorkshire, the amazing things that are going on here, the heritage that the region has, but also the importance of collaboration and the success that it generates. Therefore, it's fantastic to see that the LEP and the Combined Authority have set out their long-term vision in the just demonstrated or displayed innovation framework. But on to today's session, it will form two parts. The first, I'm delighted, uh, will be, well, with Kirsten England, the, the Chief Executive of Bradford Council and the Lead Chief Executive for Innovation, who will provide a introduction to the region's new innovation framework. And for the second part, and perhaps the main event, I'm sure Kirsten, you won't mind me saying that, I'm okay. pleased to welcome one of Yorkshire's own sons, Sir George Buckley, a man who credits his alma mater with shaping and supporting his career, which has taken him from Sheffield to Minnesota via Huddersfield. He's the former chairman and chief executive of 3M, one of, one of the only Brits to run an American Fortune 500 company, and is currently the chancellor of Huddersfield University. Uh, he's also chairman of Smith's Group and uh, Stanley Black & Decker. So without further ado, I will hand over to you, Kirsten, to uh, talk us through the innovation framework. Thanks very much, Ben. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I don't take any offence at all at being described as the warm up act for uh, George Buckley at all. And you and I know well, each other well enough for you to say that <laughs> as well. So, look, I want to start first of all by saying um, thank you to everybody that's made uh, the West Yorkshire Innovation Festival Week such a stonking success. Clearly, it hasn't happened in the way that we might have imagined pre pandemic. Um, and I firmly believe that, you know, part of innovation. Um, supporting innovation is about creating community networks and that is about people being together and building relationships but actually we've been able to do so much and we've learned this through this last year and um, through the use of technologies and that pivot so it has also enabled us to have incredible um, uh, opportunities and speakers from far and wide including George obviously coming in from the states but also kind of um, our colleagues in the in northern Europe in the Netherlands and beyond through the Northern Lands programme. So I think it's been an amazing opportunity for people to get together and share ideas and build greater momentum for our work on innovation. Like you said, we've just approved our Innovation for Everyone framework and that kind of firm commitment from this city region, this regional economy to drive innovation as a kind of core uh, route to greater productivity and inclusive growth in our place. It's incredibly important that we commit to this because I think um, colleagues um, who know me well will know that for the last 10 years we've looked at incredible assets for innovation in the Lee City region but we haven't shifted the dial really on some of the metrics that actually talk about kind of innovation taking root in our place. So this is our firm commitment to strengthen the ecosystem that will drive innovation more certain to, and more certainly and support it into the future. Um, so what does it mean innovation for everyone? I mean, I think one of my frustrations as someone who was on the board of Nesta, one of our kind of national innovation investment organizations and has led on it for the last 10 years is it's often shrouded in mystery and exclusivity as an esoteric minority sport. And I have to say the kind of, it's frequently dominated uh, by white men that just make, you know, and that's without, without criticism, George, of you've done fantastic and amazing work. But actually, uh, it's not a space in which we've supported everybody to take advantage of kind of support for innovation. And we've often not even discovered and supported those amazing innovators within our communities. So I think part of our intention here is to actually make it an accessible, inclusive um, set of opportunities for people to kind of um, take advantage of support for innovation. And you know, it's really important to remind ourselves that kind of it's in the DNA of our region. You know, if we look back to, and I think you referred to that in your introduction, um, you know, if you look back to the 19th and the beginnings of the 20th century, you know, uh, but for those kind of revolutionary innovations in the engineering industries, we wouldn't have seen the mechanization of the textile industry. We wouldn't have seen some of the breakthroughs in the kind of broadcast technologies through et electrical engineering. And um, even if we think about social innovation in that time in the north of England, those kind of 
uh, innovations of their time, like um, the creation of the first school meal service or access to school swimming baths, the creation of model villages. You know, um, in our part of the world, if we were not the inventors of the technology, we were first movers and adopters of technology. I think the other point I'd want to make is this isn't about doing novel things all the time, but it is about being endlessly opportunistic about what is available to you and moving quickly to adopt technology. You only have to look at the, the, uh, the story of China as the absorptive state and how they kind of, they're not necessarily inventing it all, but they're certainly grabbing and making it work for them as soon as it comes to their attention. But if you even come right down to today, when I think about the innovation that is taking place across the lead situation, you know, innovations in med tech with assistive technologies, wound treatments, the biochemistry it's leading to, innovative cancer treatments, whether it's our kind of incredible work around data capture storage, data analytics, and um, the use of open data, uh, of which I am a huge fan in terms of powering innovation. Um, let's remember, of course, that things like the set-top box was invented here in West Yorkshire, which led to the um, kind of introduction of on-demand television, transforming the way that we all view content. Um, let's remember that one of the kind of businesses in the um, Leeds City region invented the QR code that has kind of powered circular economy work around the world. And even, you know, the world's first zero waste beer was invented here in the Leeds City region. You know, we have um, stories to tell of in innovation and invention at every level in terms of the business maturity cycle. So, but how do we make innovation for everyone a reality? Uh, as I've already said, I think demystifying it and making it more accessible. And of course, this festival has been absolutely part of that, of telling the stories, of sharing the, the work that is going on and building confidence to take the next steps on that. Um, telling the story, incredibly important. Creating an ecosystem that systematically nurtures and supports innovators with brilliant ideas. And for me, that is about peer-to-peer -peer networks and that sense of community. I think in, often um, amongst innovators, you'll find much more of an intention towards collaboration rather than simply competition. That balance is always constantly in play, but that kind of sense of being part of a collaborative community of innovators and entrepreneurs, incredibly in, important. And of course, this festival and the creation of the Innovation Network for West Shortshire, very important in all of that. An accessible curriculum with low cost of entry, you know, which is co-designed with innovative entrepreneurs. I mean, it's great to see some of the work and you referred to Nexus that we're now doing around the LEAP programme. And I've had a look at the people who are taking advantage of that programme and it is much more diverse and inclusive than, than many of the programmes we've seen delivered before. But great work going on. And I'm sure um, George will talk about this in Buckley 3M through Nexus, but also Bradford University Management School. Um, I do think there's much more that uh, local authorities and combined authorities LEPs can do around the cost of entry uh, and the, the cost of entry in terms of the overall infrastructure um, to get going. And then also the access to, you know, beyond retail banking to kind of angel investors or the, uh, the wider investment markets that people need to be in. Often businesses up here have struggled to get before some of the kind of equity investors who kind of circulate more in a London environment we, we need to do more to ensure that people are moving into those spaces and benefiting from that step up investment when they have great ideas to take to market. I just want to come back to the point about diversity and inclusion. Um, as I've said, you don't often see uh, women, black, Asian, ethnic minority innovators um, uh, represented um, as often as I would wish, and I know they are there. So I just want to celebrate some of the work we are currently doing across the Leeds City region to support that. Um, the work of LEP board members such as Amir Hossein, who's just launched a coaching programme for the Asian business community, started by um, bringing the big corporates around the table with 200 Asian businesses talking about diversifying the supply chain, enabling people to make connection into the supply chain and, and procurement of the big corporates, and but also bringing their products and services to the attention of those organizations. Uh, people like Kamran Rashid and Mandit Sohota, so who during the pandemic have launched the Innovation Impact Hub, which is supporting innovators um, in social enterprises. So innovation for good, really important piece of work that's going, that's going on there. Um, and finally, some of the work we're doing around digital skills now, so um, which are critical. So many businesses 
um, you know, absolutely uh, desperate to be able to access those young innovators with the requisite digital skills and the kind of digital makers program which we've launched for 30,000 teenagers with Cisco and Raspberry Pi, Lego Channel 4, looking at digital skills, not just around coding, but creativity and critical thinking, because I think many people will tell you an IT degree does not fit you necessarily with the requisite skills to really thrive in an increasingly digital world. So work is underway across all the dimensions, really, um, of the innovation framework. But, you know, this is just the beginning. We need to build on this moment and strengthen and deepen the work that, that we want to do together because our the inclusive and sustainable growth that we need for this district after the pandemic will only be secured if we fire up and tap into the energies and creativity and drive of the many innovators that we have across the Leeds City region. But look, as you said, I'm the warm up act. And without further ado, I think we should hear from someone who's really done it. So like, rather than someone who likes to reflect on and talk about it. So I want to turn to George, who um, I think we're delighted to have with us, bathed in sunlight as he is, um, and to share his experiences of working around innovation and growth over many decades. George, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kirsten. That was a, that was a whistle stop and perfect uh, open it, opening uh, for the session. Um, so yes, as Kirsten said, we'll start talking to you, Sir George. And I guess let's start in the beginning because it's a very good place to start. Can you tell everyone who's here a bit about your journey from, from Sheffield to Minnesota and everything along the way? Yes, obviously I'll make it uh, short. I don't think these things are uh, uh, benefited by a, a lengthy description, but I you know, it started in abject poverty, uh, poverty in Sheffield. I was... Uh, born in my grandmother's house, uh, raised by foster parents that actually lived at my grandmother's house. They were, it was a lodging house. And uh, uh, because I was a kind of sickly child, I went to a school for physically handicapped kids. Uh, uh, and uh, so not necessarily benefited by the, the best of education. Although my school was great, you know, but their primary role in life was, 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 was getting me well, not necessarily getting me well educated. So it started there. Uh, and I suppose that in a sense, the, the journey hasn't yet finished, although it obviously had a few uh, highlights along the way. Uh, I moved to the United States in 1978, worked for uh, initially General Motors, didn't really like it. Uh, and then I, I, I worked for a utility designing power plants, so designing nuclear power plants, designing uh, uh, the coal-fired power plants, and along the way, designing washing machines, engines, stethoscopes, electric motors, uh, and uh, a whole range of other things that are just too numerous to uh, to mention. And I think that at some stage in, in my life, like all of us, you know, when we start on our uh, life journey, we really don't know a great deal. We, we, we're never the finished uh, object, and, and I hope I'm not the finished object even, even today. Uh, and that's about uh, adaptation, adjustment, learning, uh, that needs to constantly happen in a person's, uh, in a person's career. In terms of when I finished full-time work, although my family thinks I have still more than full-time work, uh, I end up as chairman and chief executive of uh, 3M uh, in Minnesota, which is uh, one of the world's greatest innovation companies. And I, I'll try not to give a long list here, but this is the company that invented the heart lung machine. We, you know, in Britain, we tend to know about scotch tape and post-it notes. But this is the company that invented the heart lung machine they invented every pressure sensitive adhesive tape that we know today. So it's, it's insulating tapes, it's uh, uh, sticky tapes for bandages for, for hospitals. It's uh, what you'll know uh, in, uh, in Britain as tape, but it's, it's Scotch tape is the brand that uh, 3M uses. Uh, it invented the magnetic recording tape, uh, uh, CDs, uh, every hip and knee replacement technology that we know today, uh, invented cochlear implants, we even made Neil Armstrong's boots uh, for the moon. Along with, with Sharp and um, Merck, we invented uh, LCD TVs uh, and, and, and uh, the first Apple Watch was invented by 3M. I personally gave it to Tim Cook. So, so th there's actually a message in this that uh, we think sometimes that there's a vertical that you have to sort of comply to in a company. Uh, innovation uh, knows no real bounds and can go in any place uh, that, that you like. And as long as you can find a way to get that to market, it's, it's the key issue. So, so I think uh, uh, 
I would say this at the beginning, uh, that people shouldn't be put off by they don't think they're in a particular vertical or it's not their capability. Yes, 3M is a big company, but uh, this sort of um, magnificent journey of discovery that innovative companies uh, take is just, is just uh, uh, absolutely fabulous. And if you'll allow me, Ben, one last comment. Uh, in 1851, at the time of the, the Great Exhibition, with just 2% of the world's population, Britain manufactured 42% of the world's manufactured goods, and they were all right at the top of the innovative uh, pile. So uh, while we may not be necessarily ready to recreate that, the point is that this, this, this country is, uh, it, it's, its nature is, uh, uh, is one of innovative thought. And a last humorous comment, finally, a last humorous comment was, I was watching some TV program where an interviewer was interviewing a German professor. And he said, so how is it that Germany is so good at what it does? He said, oh, it's very simple. He said, we take the things that the British invent and just make them better. That, and and I, I will, won't comment, but potentially no true words have been said. Um, obviously, you, you've, you've touched on the amount of innovation that 3M's done, and obviously that you've been part of through your career, whether it was, yes, designing stethoscopes, power, power stations, right through to that first Apple Watch getting handed over. You know, what do you think one of the biggest barriers perhaps to engaging more di a more diverse range of, of innov in or individuals within innovation is? Um, I know I'm going to throw one of your own quotes back at you actually now you did you previously said in an interview the big problem uh, in engineering is it it's not sexy and it doesn't have a Bill Gates attached to it do you think that that plays a part in in that I think uh, what Britain needs certainly uh, uh, it needs heroes uh, yeah and there are many heroes in America I mean really going back to to the days of uh, of Andrew Corne uh, Carnegie, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, the Rockefellers, uh, uh, they, they were heroes. And one of the things which is interesting in America, they celebrate that kind of success and, uh, uh, and, and want to share it. And uh, so it's a very positive environment here for innovation. I think we, we have to pay attention to, to making sure that we don't, in our, in our British reserve, uh, uh, the, the fact that we, in a sense, we, we, we we want to be quietly outstanding, but not um, shining the outstanding. So it's it's part of our culture that of being of being uh, modest, of being reserved. That's that's a part of who we are. But it, you know, from my own uh, uh, perspective, in, in my case, the challenges were obviously to some degree social and and uh, to some degree economic. You know, back in those um, um, it is. I think for me personally, the the, the challenge was. A lack of self-belief, uh, because you know I grew up in a in a, in a poor family uh, in a time in Britain which was highly stratified in terms of its social uh, uh, conditioning, and so you know at the bottom looking up, you uh, you can't imagine what uh, what it might be like uh, to be in a sense at the top. But I think uh, when I speak about innovation, I I often, I won't say I always, but I often start by suggesting people need a dream. Uh, and uh, I love that, uh, that song uh, from uh, the movie South Pacific where I think Lily was called Bloody Mary, if I remember. Uh, so the scene is set in 1943 or something like that in Bali in, in Indonesia. And she sings this song called Happy Talk. Happy talky talky, happy talk. Talk about things you like to do. You've got to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, how you're going to have a dream come true? So it has to begin with a dream. And those people all, all way back when in the Industrial Revolution have a dream. And in a sense, all entrepreneurs have a dream. Uh, and they're optimistic uh, and they're curious. I mean, you can never really be an entrepreneur uh, or, or a creator unless you're optimistic. So, so breed, in a sense, breeding into society uh, this view of optimism that we can, in fact, create a, a, a better future, that we, we can alter the outcome. We can keep our eyes on the prize, so to speak. Uh, these, I think, are the things that we, we absolutely need uh, to en engender in people. And uh, uh, something I might say a little bit later uh, is we have to remember that in life, all big companies were once small companies. All big ideas were once small ideas. So they're born in some place and they, they're fostered, they're fertilized, they're encouraged, they're grown, 
until they become the kind of things that are commonplace for us in, in society. Uh, so, and, and uh, oddly enough, innovation is one of those things that doesn't really require scale, not in the, in the classic sense of the, of, of the word, uh, where, where uh, uh, creativity, imagination, yes, perhaps brains, uh, but that spark of, uh, of curiosity, of, of belief in, I've got a great idea and I'm going to give it a try. Uh, and people are often, uh, I, I see so often in life, I, I, you can imagine I've seen thousands of these examples where people are nearly always way more capable than what they think they are, way more capable. And, uh, and I was lucky enough to sort of discover that and had the help of other people to help me discover it. And I think that belief system is important for us to engender Ben in, in society today. I, I find that I find that fascinating because you're right. There is there's so many challenges to to getting that self belief, particularly into into the younger generation. And um, obviously, you touched on having a dream as being key for innovators and inventors. What what was the dream that drove you, for, if I may? I never dreamed of, of of being a CEO or anything like that. But I always dreamed of being an engineer. Uh, and uh, where did the dream come from? It was planted in my mind by my uh, by my grandmother. Uh, so I mentioned I was raised in my grandmother's house at least until I was about five. And I remember this particular day. It was a rainy day, typically in England, in north of England. And there was a lady had come to see my mother, uh, my grandmother, I should say. And uh, and uh, she did her business. It was rainy. She had one of these sort of scarves tied under her neck, typical uh, of the day. And she finished speaking to my grandmother. And, uh, and again, as was the way in the day, she turned to me. I was stood there quiet by the kitchen table. I think I was probably three years old. And she said to me, uh, and who is this young man? So in the way with my grandmother, you know, children should be seen and not heard. She said, this is my grandson, George. And this lady said to me, and George, what are you going to be when you grow up? Uh, my grandmother said, he's going to be an electrical engineer. So, so in a sense... <laughs> So in a sense, someone else planted the seed, but it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful uh, seed that, uh, that uh, with the help of others, got, got fertilized. And, uh, and, uh, and I can hardly imagine anything else that would have uh, been better for me to do than to be an electrical engineer. So, so that was the dream. And then naturally, the, the, the things that you do along the way, the things you invent, the things you develop, they're kind of episodic. Sometimes they just based, and I mean this absolutely literally. Uh, sometimes based on a uh, because I have one of those ideas laid on the bath in the bath on Saturday morning where ooh, you know the light goes on uh, and uh, and uh, and you have an idea. But you know, uh, the, turning that idea into reality is obviously the the uh, the real key issue that you you struggle with or, or don't struggle with some people. Uh, uh, and uh, so you always get input from other people uh, and making prototypes is always the key step. The absolute key step in an idea is, okay, so I've got this idea. What am I gonna do with it? Is go make a prototype, make it in the garage, make it in the, the, the local school workshop, make it in the university, uh, because then it suddenly becomes real. And it gives you the chance to, to work on the, you know, the, the molding, the, I don't mean that literally in the, in the manufacturing sense of the word, but the molding of this idea, the molding of, of, of this product, and getting input from other people. And, and so ideas are born, yes, in the mind, uh, but they become reality in prototypes. I, 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 like, I like that. Um, obviously, you know, we've, we've touched on very briefly your, your background and perhaps the, you know, the challenges um, that came from, from, uh, from growing up. You know, what message would you like to get across to perhaps the young people of Leeds City Region and West Yorkshire who have faced their own challenges over the last 12 months and, and undoubtedly will face further ones moving forward? There's, there's two things I would like to say. First of all, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a principle actually, in my case, it's a biblical principle where uh, uh, you say, keep your eyes on the prize. You have, to, you have to keep that light out in front of you. It's a guiding light, a North Star, or whatever some people want to call it. Uh, uh, don't give up that belief just because you've had a year of, of, of setback. We've all had setbacks, and, uh, and, and we'll continue to have setbacks. Uh, but to have that, 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 that guiding light in your, in your mind, it's an idea, it's a career, it's a, something you want to make, you want to invent. Have that, mind in your, uh, have that idea in your mind. But also, 
uh, I think I'm perhaps a, uh, an example of anything is possible uh, with the application of creativity, imagination, hard work, and other people I might add, by the way, uh, anything is possible. So it doesn't matter which social strata you come from. It doesn't matter what uh, uh, ethnic background you come from. It doesn't matter what gender uh, background you have. Uh, and especially, I think that's the case today. Uh, anything is possible uh, as long as you are prepared to, uh, yes, deal with some uncertainty, but use, unleash your creativity and your imagination. Just let it flow. Don't, don't be impeded by, by, by norms or people that tell you, oh, you can't, it's impossible what you're trying to do, George or Janet or John. Uh, um, you can't say it's not true. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Uh, but as I jokingly say sometimes, if it was easy, we'd give the job to an accountant. I'm sorry about the accountants there on the, on the, on the line. It's only a joke. Uh, so, uh, so I think that, uh, that having that, that abiding belief inside that, uh, that uh, almost like a mini nuclear reactor going on inside you that uh, drives you forward, these are the vital things in, uh, in, in, in uh, having dreams and, and creating dreams. And that, that, that's, a fantastic, that's a fantastic message to be able to share. I guess then, you know, looking away from, from the, the young people of the region, perhaps to those businesses that Kirsten's touched on, we, we've, ha we've got a heritage of businesses doing amazing innovations, both going back hundreds of years, but also going back literally a couple of years or right now. Um, yeah. And also ones who are perhaps starting out on that innovation journey. You know, what lessons would you, well, what lessons have you, have you learned that you'd like to pass on to them as they're looking to, to perhaps try and discover the next or be the next 3M or develop yeah. the next set of moon landing boots? <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, I mentioned this, actually two of these principles a little bit earlier. One was that, uh, remember, every large business was once a small business. So just becomes, because you're small doesn't mean you can't become large. N never be put off by that, uh, that idea of... Uh, Scale matters. Scale matters in many cases, it's true. Uh, usually if you're fighting wars, for example. Uh, uh, but in the case of when you're trying to invent businesses and invent products, scale is not nearly the same importance. Uh, money and distribution are important, of course. I mean, it, 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 we, we shouldn't discount the fact that there are, there are always barriers and challenges. Because if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. But it can be done because some people do do it. Uh, and I would say that... Uh, you know, I was once asked a question about, uh, um, it was a challenging business that we had when I worked in 3M, and, and it was actually an embraces business that we did successfully reinvent very, very well, actually. And I said, you know, I've never seen a business uh, uh, that cannot, through a combination of imagination and creativity, and along with relentless execution, cannot be made better. These are the kind of keys to success, imagination, creativity, and relentless success. and also. To, to, to always keep in mind that nothing ever happens in a company except through people. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's them that really make the difference. And it sounds all kind of trite and, oh yeah, well, George would say that, wouldn't he? But I remember uh, when I was made CEO of Brunswick, there was a man in the audience. So, you know, I'm the new CEO. I have to go give the requisite speech to the assembled masses, fine. So there's a couple of hundred people in the in the room. And one man asked me two great questions. Um, <laughs> one will come across as a bit sarcastic, but I didn't mean it to be so. He said, George, what if we spend, continue to spend all this money on leadership training and development and people leave? I said, what if we don't and they stay? Uh, and, and by the way, that's the same with innovation. What if you don't? If you don't, all you will ever be is average. Who wants to be average? Uh, none of the people we're speaking about here on this, this session today want to be average. They want to be better than average. So that was a great question. But the, the key one, when I mentioned people, he said to me, and it's, it's one of these questions that you get as a CEO, you think, well, it's a great softball question. You know, I can wang this one out of the park. And he said, George, what do you think, uh, what do you think people have in this particular uh, uh, journey of uh, uh, rekindling of this company? And, you know, the, the almost the first reaction of any CEO that's answering a question like that is said, oh, of course, they're very important. Uh, and, and they actually they mean it as well, because it's true. 
And I thought, I, I, I refuse to answer that question uh, with a pat answer. So I said, before I answer that question, I, you're all supervised in this, in this room, pretty much all of you. Uh, I'd like you to think about something for me. Think about the very best person you have working in, in your group. And uh, got that? And so I'm seeing some nods in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the audience. I said, now I want you to think about the second best person you've got in your group. Got that? Yes. I said, now I want you to think about what it would be like if they were gone, if they were not with you. So if you don't think that, uh, that I think that people are absolutely vital in this equation, uh, you're very much mistaken. They do. And uh, you, you, sometimes we're lucky enough to get uh, mini oracles, those, those folk that seem to know the answer to every question in life. Sometimes we, we're lucky enough to get people that, uh, that working with them is like having three employees working for you. Uh, uh, I mean, there, there's all, all, all kinds, but, but uh, uh, the quality of a company is determined by its people and, and how you lead and inspire them. I like that. I also enjoyed the, uh, the Americanism from, with such a Yorkshire accent of softball and hitting it out of the park. <laughs> um, which which may have told the story of your time in the states uh, and and coming from thingy. I, I was hoping for a cricket reference, if I'm honest. Well, I could have done that too. Probably. <laughs> um, but no, obviously that, that talking about people leads me on to one other question that that I always find fascinating about innovation, and it's something that Kirsten touched on at the start. It's the importance of collaboration, and whether that be collaboration within organisations or externally through you know universities or other other businesses in geo different geographies or, or whatever you know obviously in your role now as a as a chancellor of you know uh, of the university how important do you see that that relationship between business and academia to to fueling the next generation of innovation well so many of the of, of the great innovations not all of the great innovations clearly uh but many of the great innovations that we can think of uh uh, uh originally were founded in in university, in particular, some of the work on genetics, on uh, uh, fertility, uh, uh, on biometrics, uh, on mathematics, the, the 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 sort of basic toolkit that you need to uh, to push forward on things like artificial intelligence, these were all developed in in universities, and uh, and so so uh, you know partly because they had the time, partly because they had the the people with the intellect who had the training. So if you turn your back on the university's collaboration with university, universities, you cut off probably 50% uh, of the great ideas that might come your way. Uh, uh, but one of the things which I started when I worked at 3M was a, uh, a corporate venturing outfit. So we, we, we set aside, back in those days, long time ago now, we set aside 30 or $40 million a year to invest in small startup companies. And, um, and uh, we took an equity stake, we might take, Five percent, ten percent, partly to 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 help them, but nearly always to learn from them, mm -hmm. because we saw them as as being the foundations of potential new verticals for for three M. And by the way, we've done exactly the same in Stanley. We've done exactly the same in in Hitachi, and uh, uh, it's a way where you'll see the. Uh, I mean, it's breathtaking. Ben, it's absolutely breathtaking to, to see uh, the number of ideas that people have. So, for example, in Hitachi, I would think in the last year, I would think, in fact, I know the number, we've examined about 800 startup companies wow. uh, that we see as being foundational businesses for the Hitachi of the future. And, uh, and some of the work that, uh, that's, that, that's being done, uh, and so often, I will, I will say so often, they are they're, they're new graduates. They might have been trying this idea out for five years. Uh, sometimes the, the root technology comes from a university. And it's breathtaking to see the range of ideas in any company that doesn't engage in this kind of collaboration, uh, who imagines that they are the fountain of all good ideas, is, 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 is shortchanging themselves in the, uh, really shortchanging the future. So, and even, even within a company, uh, I mentioned, that uh, you know, often whether it's a great symphony or great painting, uh, it's nearly always uh, one or two people have those those ideas. But even a great painting, often the great painters had 
uh, apprentices paint the background. Uh, they filled in the blanks, shall we say. And uh, they, they help build the prototype, maybe uh, is another way of describing it. So, so, so uh, when, uh, when I was working on washing machines, um, uh, you know, my boss had said to me, uh, George, I want you to go out and reinvent American laundry. Uh, and so, okay, so I'd done the laundry about four times in my life at that time. So, so you start the process and you think it through and you see where the weaknesses are and you work on those. And you get an outline relatively quickly of how the technology might work. So then I took it to, to my friend in the, uh, the appliance motor engineering department, a man called Bill Schneider. And uh, so, uh, so when I told him, I said, Chuck wants me to reinvent the American laundry. He said, what the heck does that mean? I said, I don't know, but here's what I think. And uh, uh, so I chose a particular technology that had never been made. I, I knew it would work perfectly if I could make it work commercially. Uh, so technologically, I knew it was the perfect solution. So Bill said to me, why have you picked that technology? Isn't, nobody's ever got that to work. It'll never work, George. I said, Bill, it's only physics. And I think that when, you, when you're in the business of, of innovation and, and creativity, uh, there are a few things like this. There are uh, ideas uh, like it's only physics. Yes, I know nobody's ever done it before, but it's only physics. And uh, so I said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, Bill, what I'm going to do is, uh, yes, I know these things are very noisy, these, these, these motors, uh, but I'm going to treat it. And this is how sometimes you bring in these parallel universes, Ben. I said, I'm going to uh, suggest we do this in the same way that the first doctor that ever kept a patient living in uh, with rabies. He knew he couldn't cure rabies, so he treated the symptoms. He treated it symptomatically. We know all the sources of this particular problem. We're going to treat them symptomatically. And I think that uh, 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 doing that kind of thing is uh, treat the symptoms. And the other thing is going back to the keep your eyes on the prize. I remember as a, as a, as a PhD student, my uh, 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 PhD supervisor gave me this pile of scientific papers to read. And, uh, you know, was reading for two weeks, I could understand 1% of the one and nothing of the next, 5% of the next, and so on and so forth. You know the routine. And uh, that weekend, I went home to my mother's, and she had a, a little entrance hall and a staircase going up. And I realized that uh, 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 it was just one of those epiphanies that come along. The only thing I need to do at this moment in time is to get from step zero to step one. I don't need to have to know how to get from step 13 to 14. I don't need that. Uh, and when I get to step two, all I need to know is how to get to step three. And that comes back to the having the dream, keeping your eyes on the prize, uh, and this belief that uh, whatever the metaphor is that we want to use, that uh, uh, you can always eat the elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> so that, I, f I, find, I find that fascinating. And I particularly liked the, the, way, the way you mentioned that the good ideas can come from anywhere. I, uh, I recently interviewed someone who, um, I think we can credit with transforming sports data, but he referred to himself as a chocolate salesman uh, got a lot, who got lost, uh, and it all happened because of a chance encounter. But uh, but no, obviously looking looking to the future and building off this week of of West Yorkshire's Innovation Festival, where do you see opportunities for for Leeds City Region and West Yorkshire as we move to this post pandemic economy where I think innovation as we touched on at the start, might be better understood than ever before because we've seen the impact that technological advancement can have and how quickly it can be adopted uh, over the last 12 months. I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we've lost some of the great manufacturing industries that we had in the past, uh, but we, we can create new ones and, and new ones have been created uh, in Britain uh, off this basis. I have a kind of theory that the... Uh, and this is going to end up being a bit technocentric, Ben, so I should probably apologize for it. But, but I think the three great crystal balls on the future are, are mathematics, electronics and software, uh, and material science. These are the great change agents for the, uh, for the future. But I have to add um, medicine in all its, uh, in all its uh, uh, forms and, and, shall we say, all things or anything digital. These are, these are the places where, you know, mathematics is in the mind. Electronics is on a... On a, on a on a test bench, material science is in a lab. Uh, 
uh, medicine may be in a lab, digital is on a computer. Uh, we don't need the scale that we once did in heavy manufacturing industries. So, so these are these are uh, uh, these are sort of building blocks that, that start from from education, which means, of course, they have to start from uh, good schooling, uh, uh, good ed good universities. But I also I also think that uh, one thing that we need to do to encourage our children to do more is creative play. So we think creative play perhaps is only on computers and iPads, but, uh, but there's still a lot to be said in creative play with Legos and my version of the McConnell set. And, uh, and even back in my day, you know, the, the old wooden fort with, uh, with a bunch of soldiers. And of course the Germans always lost uh, in, in, in my, but that's sort of freeing the mind to, to imagine. Uh, and I think this word, Ben, uh, imagine. Let me just think of this word. Let me say it three or four times. Just the power of the word, imagine. And one of the things which I used to do uh, when I was a young man in trying to figure out what to do next is I might be given a business opportunity. And I used to write imagine charts. Uh, they were my, you might say they were prize charts. They were dream charts. Call them what you want. But I think this is always where the, uh, the, uh, the tap root of these sorts of things come from is, is imagination. But then the tools that you bring to it, uh, uh, like what we were saying, mathematics, electronic software, materials science, medicine, digital, uh, these are the tools that you bring to crack those, uh, crack those problems. And we absolutely, unquestionably have the kind of educational system, uh, and even for that matter, the society that, uh, that can do that kind of stuff in the UK. No, no problem at all. You just, we just need to unleash people, get them to believe in themselves. And I think we're aware that. I, I, I find that that message both, but you know, very very heartening because the power of imagination, as you said, is well, it's 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 uncom uncompre uncomprehensible in a sense. Uh, but also to touch on that point you brought, you mentioned earlier, that power to be optimistic. And I think if you if you yeah. can bring those two together, the, the world is your oyster, as as my my, uh, my 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 dad would say to me. Yes. Um. Obviously. You know, you've you've touched on this. It's not the end of your journey yet. You know, where 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 are you excited, or what are you excited about now? Looking, you know, looking at, at a new generation of innovators who hopefully are following your example. And this will be my last question because I'm I'm conscious hey, no uh, to we we are we're running out of time. But you know, what are you excited to see coming through? You know, you've talked about those 800 businesses or, or ideas that are coming through Hitachi. You know, obviously, don't give any away. But you know, what what sort of what sort of concepts are really really setting the fire? Uh, the the uh, uh, the power of some of the genetic engineering being done in medicine, and 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 the chance to change therapies for for people who suffer uh, terminal diseases, ALS, for example, uh, uh, that uh, has no real effective treatment today. I think that's just so wonderful uh, to be able to do that kind of stuff. So. I'm just hugely encouraged by that kind of stuff. I'm encouraged by, of course I would be, wouldn't I? I'm encouraged by the power of mathematics. So, uh, so uh, deep cognitive learning, artificial intelligence. I will point out uh, something which, uh, which uh, people perhaps don't always understand is, I do jokingly say that artificial intelligence is two things. It's not artificial and it's not intelligent. Uh, uh, because, uh, 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 artificial intelligence, we, we called it we called it different things over the years. Uh, but if it's not in the data, it's not in the future. It's not fortune telling. Uh, it's pattern recognition is what it is. And again, that's another it's rooted in it's rooted in mathematics. Uh, and the power that uh, that that branch of, of science has to extract insights that we could never even with the colossal processing capability of the human mind, we cannot see. Uh, you could have hundreds of thousands of people looking at the dis this data, you just couldn't see it without the power, power of, of mathematics. So I'm incredibly, uh, incredibly encouraged uh, uh, by that. Uh, obviously the power of computing and quantum computing, possibly for the future, uh, making absolutely transformative leaps in, in processing power is another one which is out there, already exists uh, in, in, in serious prototype form. Uh, for me personally, I'm involved in three startup companies, and that's not quite true. I'm probably involved in about maybe ten, but three that I'm 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 a lead 
a, a lead participant in. Uh, one is oddly enough is on on the uh, pest control, uh, trying to find better ways to to control. In particular, started with mosquitoes, so getting rid of Zika and uh, uh, yellow fever and uh, malaria, helping to control those sorts of things. Uh, but also on uh, on electronics. So so I'm involved in in working. Uh, if you can think of Teams and Zoom, but, but on 18 doses of steroids. That's what we're working on. It, the product's out in the marketplace now, are growing like Topsy, and uh, and changing the way that we, for example, in this particular environment, could could share ideas, collaborate, sort good ideas from bad ideas, doing it all automatically. Absolutely fabulous. So, so many different things that uh, uh, that we could talk about, that we could take all morning talking about the opportunities out there. But I will say, perhaps in conclusion, Ben, one last thing: we are at the cost. Of, of a change in technology and society that we've never seen since the time of the Industrial Revolution. And whether that's in uh, electrification, I'm talking about vehicles, but all things, all things electric, uh, uh, biodegradable, really compostable plastics, uh, 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 anything related to the environment uh, and, and, and green energy. Uh, uh, the, 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 the opportunities are endless, uh, even in manufacturing with, uh, uh, with machine vision, machine automation, uh, in medicine, as, as we speak, there are just, it's, we, honestly, I really believe this, Ben, we're at the cusp of the greatest change since the Industrial Revolution. All of us on this call and people who are interested in these, these issues of innovation, uh, we should begin to embrace it and, and take it to the best possible outcome. And I don't think I could have written a better ending if I tried. So on that note, I will say thank you very much to Sir George Buckley. Thank you very much to Kirsten England. And thank you very much to everyone who has joined us uh, this afternoon. The West George Innovation Festival does carry on for one more event uh, this this afternoon with Nexus, which I believe starts at two o'clock. Um, but until then, uh, I thank you very much. There will be a write up about this on the businessdesk.com and a video made available early next week. So thank you very much, George. And thank you very much. Thank you,